Hello, and welcome to Indiana Issues, the online public affairs program. We'll go beyond the headlines and sound bites and bring you all of Indiana's news in its entirety. I'm your host, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. And today we got our round table panel with us. Uh, immediately to my right, which would be your left, is Brad Kloppenstein, our resident libertarian, Democrat Laura Beck. Our political analysts uh, and neutral party, Eric Berman of WIBC Radio. And immediately to my left, which would be your right, is Joey Fox of the Marion County Republic, former chair, executive director of the Marion County Republican Party. Brad, Laura, Eric, Joey, welcome everybody to Indiana Issues. Good to have you folks all here thanks today. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have about seven, eight days until the primary. Uh, Eric Berman, it cannot get here soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the feeling at about this point. It can't get here soon enough. And, it, and I'm not even sure that we're in that usual phase of there's no, com there's no commercials for anything except candidates. We haven't quite reached that full saturation yet, and so it's going to step up over those next eight days. Uh, Joey, uh, this campaign, uh, can May 8th get here soon enough and all these people, at least two of them, go away? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's time. Of course, it, we've got to remember, we, we always talk about Election Day, but over the last 10 years, right, and it continues to go, people have been voting for 20-some days already, and they're voting right now, and they're going to be continuing to vote. You know, the Election Day is, is has become a, a more minor event than, than it was at one point, so... You know, you've got to look at, you know, when Todd Rokita is getting slammed by the Trump campaign after he's hogtied himself to the president's leg, you know, dur during all that. Well, for those few days after that, right, that's going to affect that's going to affect your numbers that, of actual vote totals. And so I just think it's a it's a fascinating uh, time period right now. Laura. Oh, gosh. <laughs> this has been a fun one to watch. Um, what I think has been really interesting about it, too, from the perspective, too, of what Joey's saying as well is, is that usually – at this point in time, you're sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? You know, there's always going to be some nuclear negative ad. And so, so far, it's been like that every step of the way with the Republican primary for Senate. And so I'm sort of wondering what's going to happen within the next few days as we lead into Election Day about what will the really negative mailer or negative ad be where someone doesn't have a chance to respond. Now, my money's on Rakita that he's going to be the one to do it, but... Um, sort of waiting to see what that happens as, as if where's the places you go wasn't <laughs> worse as it that could be that was awful yeah so brad is this basically and we'll actually we'll get to that in just, <laughs> okay. just a little bit good, good, good. That, that sort of horton here's a what the hell yeah uh, <laughs> brad has this basically been the been the campaign where every bomb is a nuclear bomb and will there be, really be anything left in the landscape for anybody to claim i've never seen such scorched earth out of all candidates and all races this has been amazing now, for somebody from the libertarian perspective who is forbidden from even participating in the primaries, this is great. I mean, this has just given us a lot of meat for the general election coming up in the fall. Laura's kind of in the same situation. You don't really have any any contests that are ugly. It's right. the Republicans, though. They're killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I think that as a party, they are less for what's going on. I can't recall a primary that's been this nasty. Luger Murdoch was pretty nasty. People Not forget Rex bad. Early, Steve Goldsmith right. for governor was a very nasty primary. But I mean, in part because you've got 50% more candidates, um, but also because the tone has just been off the charts, uh, off the charts negative. Well, and the thing is, back to, to Joey's point, just quickly, there's amazing numbers of undecideds. Normally, you'd think a lot of those votes are uh, are already locked in. But the lowest undecided number I've seen is 20 percent. I've seen numbers as high in that Gravis poll, 45 percent. When nearly half the electorate is undecided, this is still up for grabs for the next negative nuclear bomb that drops. And let me ask Joey about that, because what does it tell you, you know, as sort of our Republican in residence here, you know, that for, up to 45 percent of Republican voters are undecided is because the candidates have been trying to be so Donald Trumpish that you might actually find some Donald Trump DNA, you know, on them somewhere that pardon pardon the, the visual <laughs> image. Oh gosh, yuck! Hey hey, this, hey, this, hey, this is online. We can say a lot more things here that we, that we could never say on regular Are live television. Here? <laughs> no, not really. Oh, it oh, yeah. wasn't briefed uh -oh. on any. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the fact that everybody's still trying to be Donald Trump that you know they they're ignoring the non Donald Trump voter. And and please keep in mind, folks, forty seven percent of Republican primary voters did pick somebody else other than. Now, Donald Trump in 2016. Well, look, clearly, because of the way this campaign is being run, there's polling that says, right, they need to be tying themselves close close to the president. Um, I don't necessarily ag 
agree wholeheartedly with that tactic. I think Hoosiers, generally speaking, want somebody that can solve problems, which is why I'm supporting Luke Messer in this, because you've got a, a long history of solving problems. What's happened in this primary is you've had two other candidates in Rokita and Braun that have just completely created a brand new identity for themselves out of thin air for this primary. Um, you know, Rokita comes out with this defeat the elite stuff um, when he's been in elected office for, for, 15, for 15 years and was, used to be more socially moderate than he is now. Um, you've got Mike Braun, who was a Democrat for 40 years and is now, you know, all of a sudden a, you know, a, conser- a conservative Republican. And you've got Luke Messer sitting there who's been working on education reform, has been working in party organizations and showing his commitment to, to the state for, for a long time. And I just, I just think it's, it, it's become kind of a joke, right, watching everybody just reinvent themselves for the purposes of a primary. It can't, it can't sustain itself. Laura, I've seen the look before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know my looks. That's sort of sad. Um, here's the only problem, though, with that is that this – this primary to me is such a dearth of ideas. There are no ideas. It's just a bunch of people fighting with each other. And so when that is the case, and even though your point is that, yeah, it's a joke, these guys are reinventing themselves, but um, it's not that uncommon for that to happen because reinventions happen all the time, right? Sure. So you've got, what what I think is really going to be fascinating about this is you've got Messer and Rakita, who are so blinded by their dislike and hatred for each other that they've forgotten they're running for Senate. And then they're creating this pathway for Braun, I think, to come in. And his narrative right now, I think, is catching on. It's working. And his ads are probably, of the ads I've seen, they're the best ads. Um, It's kind of a joke. I was really tied up with my son's school fundraiser last week, so I really didn't catch a lot of news. But we watch Jeopardy every night at 730, so I've seen all the ads. (laughs) Uh, I've seen all the ads with my 10-year-old. But those are the ones that are really resonating. The Swamp Brothers is really resonating. And so, but then you're looking at these goofy Rakita who's become, not, I mean, not goofy, but they're goofy ads and he's becoming a caricature of himself. And so for somebody like Luke Messer, who has been a pretty thoughtful elected yeah. official, where do you go in that? So that to me has stood out. You you probably have smarter ideas because you're sitting here nodding at me. <laughs> no, I think the ads... That could have, be my cue to stop talking. <laughs> the, the, the ads have been very effective, I think. Uh, and uh, what Braun has done, I don't know that Mike Braun could do what he's done if it were a one-on-one race, if mm-hmm. it had been uh, outsider versus insider. But he's got the same dynamic that Trey Hollingsworth had in his house race two years ago. I'm the outsider, and you've got all these insiders. He was able to put Aaron Houch and Greg Zeller together. It's even easier for Mike Braun because, look, they're both in Congress. They both went, well, they all went to Wabash. They both they, wear red ties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the, the cardboard cutout ad is, is a very effective ad. There's there's been some very creative mm-hmm. ad work, I think, out of all three campaigns. But uh, but Braun has been on message with that. Brad, before we move on to some of the, the campaign tones, I mean, what does it tell you that, you know, like we said, you know, we have so many undecided voters right now you know, in a Republican primary as, as the outsider looking in, so to speak? I, I think all three of them have a problem. Surely they have consultants saying, we've got to improve your likability. <laughs> because there is not a single one of them that is doing anything to improve likability. And that's why there's so many undecideds. I think you've got a whole lot of would-be Republican voters who are like, these are my choices. Yeah. And I have no idea why Messer and Rokita hate each other so much. I mean, on paper, the Swamp Brothers ad works because they're practically the same yeah. guy. You know, they're the same age, went to the same school. Uh, you would think that they would be best friends and these would be very cordial interactions. <laughs> Even their spokesman names kind of sound the same. I get them kind of confused to like, you know, <laughs> spokesman names. Sorry. So, Sorry to interrupt No, you. no, that's, that's fine. So <laughs> I don't get it, but I would think, and it's probably too late now, but somebody has to get their likability up there. They need to be petting dogs and saving kid- <laughs> kittens or well, something. One of the points we had been talking about, uh, you know, Privately, among you know, when we when us Republicans get together, you know, and and and, and talk about that's, such that's things. That's my mom's family reunion, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, somebody needs to close. Nobody's closed this race yet. We were talking about the negative stuff that that hasn't hasn't done, and, and that that's part of it, right? But there's there's also there's also this opportunity. You've got to have somebody's got to have a final message 
that then that is positive, right? That com- that come that comes together and that starts to clinch this thing up. And it, nobody's done it. We, it still feels like we're in the middle of the campaign to some degree. I want to change gears a little bit. By the way, you're watching Indiana Issues Online. Indiana Issues, the public of the online public affairs program that talks about uh, Indiana politics and government and all these other sorts of fun things. Our guests today are Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Laura Beck, uh, analyst Eric Berman, and Republican Joy Fox. Uh, I want to talk about the commercials uh, because the fact that we have you know, gone or gone ugly so early, so quick. And if I get you guys back in the control, we want to bring up Todd Rakita's children's book uh, that made a lot of news uh, this week. It's sort of a, it's sort of in the, that Dr. Zeus sort of spirit of, of of storytelling. You know, where is Luke Messer? We we can't find him. Is he here? Is he there? Uh, as I try to uh, bring that up, uh, Eric, what does that tell you that when Dr. Seuss books now come into play? in a Republican Senate campaign. There it is right there. All the places uh, you'll forget. Eric, what does all this tell you? You know, I thought that was a a very creative touch. It it also gave rise to maybe my favorite line in any of the reporting on this campaign. The Indianapolis Star piece, I think it was Tony Cook, uh, said with a straight face, this is not the first time that there's been a connection between children's literature and Indiana politics this year. (laughs) Where are we? Uh, <laughs> Indiana politics and children's literature, talking about the, the Marlon Bundo book. But, yeah, it, it's a creative attack. Whether it's a successful line of attack, I think, is still open to conjecture. I'm not sure that that plays as well in this race as it did against Richard Luger and Evan Bayh. There's lots of other lines of attack that are playing out. But if you're going to make this one, I thought that was a creative way to do it. Joe, let me ask you, since you are, you know, like I said, you know, a Luke Messer sure. supporter, you know, when you see that, you know the the you know the all oh, the places you will go. Does what does oh, the that do? Places you'll forget. The places you'll forget. Forget. Yeah, I, I forgot already. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it didn't it didn't resonate with you. So, you know, I, I always assumed we would have to communicate at the Rokita campaigns level and have to use coloring books to talk to each other, but where where we where we are now is and this is a direct attack on family, is what this is what this is. Luke Messer moved his family to Washington, D.C. to be with him while he's serving in Congress and while he's serving the state. He still owns uh, his house with his mom. Luke was uh, was raised by a single mom, and and he and he uh, and he didn't. Right wait a minute! There. Wait a minute. I, I know Luke's dad. Luke's dad has been as involved in his life as his mom has been. I think it's very disingenuous on his commercials implying that he had an absentee father. That was not the case. The other thing is, it's not this what is he the... said. He said he was raised by his mom. But let's before we get into a, before we get into this about family. This is the same argument that the Republican u- used against Evan Bayh. No. He, yeah, he moved to D.C. to be with his kids. I mean, that was part of the reason why. He was a really active and engaged dad. And, and that really came back. mattered to him. Yet, yeah, no, he did come back. So it's really hard for you, I think, to make that kind of argument in a general. That's the difference between primary and general, right? You can say it's all about family. But then how are you going to pivot to that during the general election when... That's the line of attack you used on Evan Bayh. But, but, but because guess, Evan Bayh didn't know his address. But, but I guess the question is, let me, let me ask you, Eric, because one of the things that did pop up is the fact that, you know, Luke Messer, and, and there was a little bit of hint of this in the, in the very first debate, where Luke Messer said, hey, you know, yes, we moved to D.C., here's, here's my address, because I, I do not want my kids to have an absentee father. And Todd Rakita kind of sort of shot back saying, hey, this is an insult to anybody who's a truck driver who, oh, who can't be home because... We all know that Rakita, you know, spends all the time DC comes back here. I mean, it, is this an issue, or is this just again just another example of how this whole thing is devolved and devoid of any real substantive, you know, public policy issues in this in the Senate race? Well, I mean, when you've got three guys who, you know, it's easy to lose track of this. It's hard to get this sheet of paper between these three guys on the issues. You've got three Republicans with a conservative line. Um, I think that they disagreed on the uh, omnibus bill. And at one point, they disagreed on tariffs, although even that's closed up. And beyond that, it's hard to find any differences among them. So where do you draw the distinction? This is one of the ways that they're trying to draw the distinction. Does it resonate? I doubt it resonates for very many people, but it doesn't have to. Somebody may win this thing with 34% of the vote. You've got that huge chunk of undecideds. Any vote that you can sway by any means necessary it is where they are, and that's, so uh, again, one of the lines of attack. I do just think somebody needs to ask Congressman Rokita, though, because he said Luke Messer abandoned his constituents by moving his family to, to D.C., and I just would be very curious to know if he believes the same about Mike Pence when he moved his family to D.C., and he's, you know, supposed to be the Trump-Pence guy, and yet 
did Mike Pence abandon his constituents but, but when he what, moved his family to D.C.? But what you're going into right now, Joey, is inside baseball. And Absolutely. that no, it, is you're going into base politics. You're going into the primary base politics. Right? right. But you guys have to pivot to a general. And so you're going to spend all this time killing each other over base politics. And then you have to pivot to a general and you're bruised and battered coming out of that because then the message in people's mind is none of these guys live here. Right. Or the message is that it, it gets all muddled up in that general piece. So. That to me is always what's fascinating about primaries um, at all different levels is that you're you're you have to tack so far in one direction that's really hard when you have to come back and win that sliver of voters that can put you over the top. Well, speaking of primaries, something else we also saw uh, this week, ladies and ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> over in the fourth congressional district, some mailers went out. Uh, Citizens for a Stronger America, I believe, was the name of the super PAC. Uh, Taking aim at Diego Morales, and we could sort of bring maybe so it's on the big screen here. Diego Morales Jeez. just honest and that wow. can't can't keep <laughs> a job. Can't keep yet. a job, boy. And then then the other oh, one. Uh, let's bring up the next one, which is actually I thought was even more brutal. Uh, Diego Morales needs a map in our district, sort of alluding that San Diego does not live in the district. The Diego campaign getting a hold of me saying, "Hey, this makes him look like an illegal immigrant roaming around the fourth, yeah. uh, trying to find." What's going on? Uh, they they accuse the the Steve Braun people of putting this out. Braun people say no, we had nothing to do with that. That's a super PAC, and they didn't talk about the three hundred thousand dollars that super PAC has spent going after Diego Morales. I ask you, Mr. Berman, once again, can May eighth not get here soon <laughs> enough? <laughs> Uh, May 8th cannot get here soon enough. I, I would draw a distinction. I mean, th that's nasty. It's ugly. It's brutal. It's levels of magnitude below what we're seeing in the Senate race. This is kind of standard issue. I, mean, I mentioned a couple of contested primaries. There was the, the Susan Brooks, David McIntosh primary. That got nasty. Luke Messer's been through this before when he mm -hmm. challenged Dan Burton. I mean, Primaries get ugly because, just like regular campaigns get ugly. That That I would call very much within the normal spectrum of what we're accustomed to seeing. And again, part of it is that there's two candidates doing it. Jim Baird is a major candidate in that race, but has not weighed in at that level. It's nothing like the Senate race because there's fewer guys throwing punches. Um, is this, uh, Joey Fox, quote unquote, racially tinged as the Diego campaign people would like to say it is? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't like to go. I don't like to get involved in in identity politics. But here, here's what I would say: is is that Diego, regardless whether you're supporting his campaign or not, Diego is a patriot. Uh, this is a guy who served in the United States military before he was a citizen, um, and then then became a citizen. Has contributed, worked for worked for Governor Governor Pence. I know him to be an upstanding guy. I think I think these are unfair unfair attacks. There's nobody that knows the state of Indiana much better than Diego Morales. He's been to all 92 counties, God knows how many times through his you know political travels, and now certainly knows his way around the congressional district. Is this Brad unfair, or is this just politics? To some degree, it's just politics. Although I'd like to think that the racial undertones would eventually yeah. go away, and yeah. we could all just kind of accept each other. But yeah. sadly, when you've got a dozen people effectively scrambling for one seat, weird stuff starts to happen. Our guests today are our good friends, Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Laura Beck, uh, political analyst uh, Eric Berman, WIBC Radio, and Republican uh, Joey Fox. You're watching Indiana Issues Online, where we talk about uh, some of the big news items facing the state of Indiana. I want to circle back uh, to the debates, because apparently a, a rumor has that there's one coming up on Monday. <laughs> Who's moderating that? Oh. <laughs> I don't know who is doing that. Yeah. Uh, He's so imbalanced. <laughs> I can't believe how unfair he is. Such a liberal. He's I know. So awful. I, I, I was definitely unbalanced. Jeez, so we, yeah. <laughs> you got imbalanced. The, Maybe I should say imbalanced. You got the imbalanced part right. Just talk to my wife. Uh, but but I guess the question is, you know, as we you know, sort of you know, get ready to wind this all down, this you know, it's been filled with you know the controversy. We are going to show up. We aren't going to show up. This is the this is the last best hope I would argue for all three of these candidates to to make their you know Joe like you said you know maybe make their sales pitch for free. You know, to to as wide an audience as you're going to get. What are you thinking, Joel? I'll start with you. You know, if you're a Luke Messer, Mike Braun, Todd Rakita, thank you for showing up and playing. What what do you got to do to to knock it out of the ballpark? For so, I'll try and just put my analyst hat on for a second. I think from from Mike Braun's standpoint, he just needs to not screw up, right? I think the bars the bars pretty low uh, for for him. Uh, Rokita, I think, is is destined. He's there to do, to put on a show and not debate the issues. I think he's made that clear by the uh, 
uh, like I might show up, I won't show up. You're a liberal. You're too. You're not conservative enough. Whatever. Um, and I think Luke Messer's got the best chance to kind of come up the middle of all of all of that and put forward a positive vision for his his candidacy um, that will that will that will uh, kind of preview what the last week of this campaign is going to look like. Brad. I- well, I would suggest for Mike Braun to not look like he just came in from mowing the lawn like he did in the Wish TV debate. <laughs> he is running for Senate. Well, <laughs> a lot of lawn. You know, it is not. You know, there are there are times, like try and tell my 10-year-old son, there are times when you have to wear a collared shirt to church. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, there is a you know, time and a place for everything. Yeah, they, and you know, he's really hurting me on this They effort. always say dress for the job you want, right. not the job Thank you yeah. have. Yeah, and definitely. So I, I understand where he was coming from. Um I do think it's going to be probably a little bit better watch just because there was some controversy on this. Hopefully the, mar- the, uh, the moderator can keep better <laughs> control of this debate than the last couple because it's going to get wild. I mean, all three of them have to throw that knockout yeah. punch, and they're going to be talking over each other worse than we do. And <laughs> oh, But we like each other. We There's do like difference. each other. So, uh, I, That's because we all didn't go to Wabash. I, I want to see them all hug at the end. That's really what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Mr. Barbie Big group hug. That'd be lovely. <laughs> Big group hug. Um, what do they need to do? They need to not screw up, and that goes for all three of them. And debates, particularly at the state level, are it can more easily hurt you than they can help you. The other thing that comes to mind here, you know, Mike Davis, when he was in his second year coaching IU, was experimenting with his starting lineup in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And uh, go figure, that didn't go well, first round exit. It's a little late to hit on a new strategy. They've all decided on what their message is. I expect them all to stay on brand. I think it would be a mistake for them to try and shift gears eight days before the election. Laura? Yeah, I, I agree with Eric. I think the other part here is to do no harm. Um, in this last debate, I, I think for for them, I, I do agree. I think that Rakita is going to come out really blustery and really swing in that I'm the I'm the Trumpian of the Trumpist. Um, I, I think Mike Braun really does have the best opportunity, though, to make that compelling case again to 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 go up the middle. The challenge for Messer is on this one is that he's really got to continually distinguish himself. He can, but the challenge is there is he's got to really make that distinction um, as to why he should be hired as opposed to these other two. But I hear, I hear what you all are saying, which is, you know, don't change, you know, these are the closing days, don't, strain, don't change strategy, you know, maybe a little bit too late, but does the fact that, as we mentioned earlier, we have so many undecided voters out there, does somebody have to do something to get somebody's attention and, and move that needle. But we don't know, though, what else is going to be coming out. We don't know if there's going to be a negative ad. We don't know if there's going to be, um, a, you know, I don't, don't want to say October surprise, but late April, yeah. early May <laughs> surprise. Really, well, I mean, in the end of weather, it'll we feel like an October surprise. We don't surprise. know if Eric is going to break some huge story, you know, Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, I mean, there's a lot that can happen. And so in the context of the debate, we don't know how that is all going to play out. You know, Julie made a great point earlier. Somebody needs to close. Mike Braun has released what he says is his closing argument ad. I would assume that's coming from the other two. In a sense, this is their closing argument. But what gets in the way is the negativity because somebody is going to come out swinging early and none of these guys can let an attack pass. They they, they all feel the need, probably rightly, but they all feel like they've got to get back and fire back. And the next thing you know, any closing positive argument you make get swamped by the throwing punches at each other. You're watching Indiana Issues online. Indiana Issues, the public affairs program, will go beyond Indiana's headlines and sound bites and bring you a uh, perspective about what's going on actually here in the state of Indiana. Our guests today are Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Laura Beck, analyst Eric Berman, and Republican Joey Fox. Uh, it was a State of the City address this week. Annapolis Mayor Joe Hawk said, Doing his third state of the city address, uh, the mayor, you know, talking about crime, talking infrastructure, uh, talking about sort of modernizing uh, city government, but also something else uh, the mayor talked about was that you know said if we do all these things, if we work together, you know, Indianapolis can be strong. Normally in these state of the city addresses, you know, people have the state of the city is strong, solid, secure, but he waited till the till the very end. Uh, I'll talk to my Irvington constituency yeah. over here. <laughs> right. uh, the east side. The east, we'll, the east we'll side. We'll throw up our east side signs. Yeah. East we'll side. throw up our gang oh, side, yeah. which, is a, which is a rake, you know. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> how's don't mess with us on the east side. How, how is the mayor Irvington doing? Gothic. I mean, you know, here we are, sort of year three. We, we've seen record potholes. We've seen, unfortunately, record you know homicides. What economic development we have seen you know, was sort of started under Greg Ballard, and usually the states carried most of the water. How is Indianapolis doing? Indianapolis, I think, has a quality of life problem that the mayor is shepherding over right now. 
he needs to be far more visible and saying, here's our problems, we need to tackle these, and here's how we're going to address them. Obviously, we have an infrastructure problem with the roads. The state is starting to have this similar problem. It's just the weather, and we have that in Indiana. But you have to be talking about this on a daily basis, saying this is what we're doing, this is how we're going to address it. We still have not really addressed the, the major crime problem, the violent crime problem. We have a drug problem in Indianapolis. Um, it's not necessarily unique to Indianapolis, but it needs to be addressed. And by and large, you don't hear from the mayor. And I think that's going to be a problem for him. Laura? Well, I think one of the real challenges of being a big city mayor is that you, you don't have time, right? Um, you don't have time, but you also have everything coming at you at 90 miles an hour all day long, every day. Um, and I mean, that same is true. I mean, even when you were in Beach Grove, I sure. mean, it's like, you know, everyone looks to you to solve all the issues. One of, I think, the challenges, though, that that we're really facing in Indianapolis is that we we really have to have, and I think in the state of Indiana, too, we have to have some difficult conversations about who do we want to be and how do we want to get there? And I think sometimes we look at, okay, the governor has to be the person to do this and the mayor has to be the person to do this. But if you live in a community where nobody wants your taxes raised, right? Nobody wants to pay extra for taxes. Okay, well, then your roads are going to have holes in them. I mean, that's just a, a consequence of that. Um, the other challenge I think we have is with crime, and that is with crime, it's, it's so much more than the actual crime. It's about what brought you to this place and how did you get here and how do we fix those problems? That leads back to education. That leads back to poverty. That leads back to food insecurity. That leads back to all of those different pieces. And so as we are looking as a community, I, I think we are really good at coming together around, for instance, bringing a Super Bowl here or we're going to do these great things as a city. But we have to put that same energy behind how do we fix poverty? I mean, you step out of the shadow of downtown and, you know, you just drive to Irvington or drive to the east side and it's different cities. And I think at some point in time as a community, we have to recognize that there are different cities. And how do we bridge that together rather than saying, what's the mayor going to do to fix it? How do we as a community come together to fix it together? Sure, let me get you to chime in because we're, as we're getting ready to wind down here real quickly. So I, I don't necessarily disagree with a lot of what, what, Laura, what Laura has said. If the mayor would just say those things, I think we could be having a really good conversation. We did elect him to lead the city. And in, you know, in my humble opinion, he is not leading. Um, I went back and read his 2016 State of the City address uh, in, in preparation for, for, for today. And we're, st we're still talking about the same, we're still talking about the same things. We're still, we're still not there. He is the most risk averse mayor. Um, not that I'm, you know, a hundred years old or anything, but you know, I mean, that, that I, that I've ever seen. He just, he will not take a risk to go out there and say, look, we've got to do something really unpopular to, to, to do this. And in fact, it goes above and beyond and says, well, we'll never have to raise taxes in order to do the criminal justice center. Well, Good luck, right? You know, in, in in that kind of stuff. He's had some. There have been some good ideas. There have been some things here, but uh, I think the most telling thing that we have to look for going into 2019 is the. I think it was downtown Indy that did the did the poll, and people's perceptions of downtown as being a safe place are down. And I think that is damning to a mayor. Uh, before we wrap up and close up uh, our conversation here, we like to do our last episode where we look, sort of look into the political ether uh, to see what folks are paying it's attention to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Mr. Berman, uh, none I fear to their embrace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When we look through the political ether, what are, you, what are you seeing? What should we pay paying attention to? Pay attention to the House primaries. There's a couple of uh, state Senate primaries that are getting a lot of attention. Uh, Mike Delph, Joe Zakis, a couple of others. I'm going to be very curious how the House primaries play out because you've got some Republican incumbents getting challenged from the right. You've got some Republican incumbents getting challenged from the left. And it'll be interesting to see if one or the other of those gets the upper hand. Laura Beck? Oh, on primaries. Um, I or think just whatever. Just whatever. <laughs> oh, geez, I don't know. Um, I think that uh, we definitely are going to be, I'm definitely going to be watching that Senate primary and that, and, and that debate that the moderator, who is just a jerk, is going to be doing. <laughs> um, definitely going to be watching that. I think also, too, some of the primaries, the, the sheriff's primary, I think, in Marion County is going to be an interesting one. I think Kerry Forrest still will ultimately win, but I think it's going to be interesting. Joy Fox? I'm watching that sheriff's primary too on the de on the Democratic side. Yeah. I find that race absolutely fascinating. We're watching 
uh, over over time what's happening with the slating systems and the and the you know, we've seen that at the national level as the institutions have started to be torn torn down we're going to see how that starts to affect uh, party organizations at yeah. the state and local level too. Brett, I'm watching the Braun brothers. It, I find it interesting. They're both <laughs> dumping a lot of money into ads. Yeah. I don't think the casual voter knows the difference between the two. I, yeah, one, one's running for Congress, one's running for Senate, but they're both on the air in Indianapolis and statewide. I'm concerned that this is going to set the tone for a Trey Hollingsworth that you have to be a multimillionaire in the future True. to get elected. That the average person, that Joey's mm-hmm. never going to get elected to anything. Because, oh, that's for damn sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the key to the vault there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I am watching that closely because that is concerning that if yeah. you don't have several million dollars of personal wealth, right. you are never going to be elected to that's the federal office. That's very true. Yeah. And actually, here's an even more fun thing. When you loan yourself campaign money, that means you can go get campaign contributions to pay yourself back. Just saying, if you're going to go try to drain a swamp, isn't America great? Yeah. Right, yeah. it's a great place. Read your dice from Admiral Hakeem Shabazz. That's cool. Lewis and Wilkins, downtown Indianapolis, <laughs> and that'll do it. Uh, I want to thank all our panel for being here thank today. Uh, Libertarian Brad Klopfenstein, thank Democrat you. Laura Thanks. Beck, analyst Eric Berman, Republican Joy Fox. Thank you. Uh, you have been watching Indiana Issues, the online version of uh, Pro Public Affairs Program. Thanks all the one our good friends down here at Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis, taking care of all of your video and online needs. Thank you all very much for being with us, and we'll see you next time on Indiana Issues.